right i think everyone sorry i am a bit late it's about we had actually announced 2 thir- 8:30 for a few people na do you want to wait for a couple of minutes or shall i start sir you can start you can wait sir i can start all right so today we had decided we'll cover the ne- few topics one is fractures of the shaft of the humerus and uh, tibia something that is again very common and uh, let's see if we can throw some light on that and the second part we'll do is ankle fractures in children which is very interesting and, and i th- i hope to teach you uh, the <clears throat> final nuances of that can you see the screen no not yet no just give me a moment i didn't share screen okay let's share screen all right can you see now yeah can you yeah you can see the screen yes sir yes sir all right all right all right all right, all right. good chalo so uh, all right so fractures of the humerus and the tibia is what we are going to talk about today and uh, let me go through this so this is a 10 year old boy and uh, what is going to be your treatment uh, i have given you a couple of choices are you going to do a desol bandage or elastic nails or close reduction and pin or open reduction and pin or just do a hanging arm cast so whoever is here can use the chat box and let's try to see what is your opinion and then we'll go ahead from there so this is proximal humerus displaced fracture all right so yeah vikram gaud says hanging cast two close reduction pinning rohit kale close reduction pinning okay so there are a few people who are in favor of doing a close reduction and pin fixation all right all right all right all right okay option 3 okay let's go ahead so this child was treated by a simple desolt kind of a arm sling okay and some oral analgesics and he was just immobilized like this for about 4 weeks and x-rays at 1 and 4 weeks right and you can see day 1 and you can see day 30 and you can see at 1 year right so what we just wanted to tell you is that subcapital fracture see please remember that the proximal humerus is the fastest growing epiphysis in the upper limb 80 to 90% of growth in the upper limb happens in the proximal femur uh, capital uh, humeral epiphysis and up to 60 degrees of varus can be tolerated up to 10 years right <clears throat> so even in widely displaced fragments in in fact there is a very <coughs> funny statement about that that in proximal humerus the two fragments will unite even if they are in the same room right that means even if they are widely displaced there is exuberant healing and excellent remodeling <coughs> because of the nature of the rapidity of the growth and remodeling in the proximal epiphysis now parents may be finicky and they may be worried if you can counsel them well in children less than 10 years up to 60 degree varus can also be accepted and no fracture will have more than that if you simply put them in a sling or a hanging arm cast now the issue is of pain relief adolescent and pre adolescent 10 and above the acceptability is lesser and there may be an indication for surgery if there is more than 50% translocation and valgus now valgus is very unusual because the proximal fragment always has abductors 
and external rotators. So this is again getting abducted and distal fragment usually gets adducted. So this is always varus. So a valgus deformity of 20 degrees will be an indication for reduction and or surgery. And an axial deviation about 12 of more than 20 to 30 degrees, right? So in those situations, you may consider intervention. And sometimes if there is a lot of pressure, you should go for the simplest and the most minimally invasive treatment, right? And which will be probably alignment under a short anesthetic and close K wire fixation, right? So K wires, the advantage is that it is absolutely minimally invasive. There is a small disadvantage that those wires tend to become loose in no time because they don't have too much purchase. Right, and you cannot mobilize the child. Whereas, if you do distal entry elastic nail, which is a divergent nailing, sometimes it is much more stable, and you need not give any kind of uh, immobilization for more than a week. You can mobilize them pretty quickly in adolescent age group, as well as the growth related issues are not there because the child is older. Even if you cross the physis with your elastic nails. And lastly, there is no skin irritation problem because it's not going from the skin. It is buried in the supracondylar region, right? So it is not an operation for beginners. You must be a little well-versed with how to do it. So now this is a 15-year-old boy who came to me all the way from Goa with this fracture, which was widely displaced on the lateral view and a varus which was more than 20, 25 degrees. So looking at his age, he was quite hefty. Like an adult, we did a reduction. And you can see a reduction with multiple pins, even though it is there, they, he did have some skin issues and it healed pretty uneventfully and remodeled quite nicely. Now, this is another 14 year old had a snowboard fall. Uh, again, he was put in a dissolved bandage, but this was the situation. Now, these parents chose that we need better alignment and elastic nails were used. So you can use elastic nailing as a modality to fix these fractures from the posterior or the posterolateral aspect going from distal to proximal as internal splints or aligners. I prefer a divergent configuration, right? So I try to use two nails which go in a divergent fashion so that we don't have to really give any kind of immobilization. These are self-sufficient and stable. I'm not, again, scientifically, I'm not saying that we need to do fixation in each fracture. It's situation dependent and most of the times closed reduction or just hanging arm sling or cast and analgesia will heal all these fractures. But 12 and above, you may consider fixation either by percutaneous K-wires or by elastic nailing such as as shown. Now, diaphyseal humerus fracture again, even a radial nerve palsy in a closed injury is not an indication for open reduction. Because all these nerve injuries are usually contusions, 90 to 95 percent will recover on their own, and there is no significant shortening or varus or valgus which needs to be addressed. If the angulation exceeds 15, 20 degrees in older child, it should be corrected. So treatment again for humerus shaft fracture can be hanging arm cast. Sarmiento brace or dissolved brace. Essentially, even adults can be treated with conservative treatment, though most of us will not do it and is not acceptable to most patients in today's era. But by far and large, hanging arm cast is an excellent way of treating a uh, uh, humerus fracture, upper third, or even diaphyseal. The options, as I said, when you have an older child, and you have a deviation or a late presentation with a deviation which is not acceptable, such as this, you may consider correction or an elastic nail. 
This is an eight-year-old boy who was treated with a hanging arm cast, and that is how he heals. Indications for nailing: pathological fracture, multiple fragments, open fracture, not enough remodeling expected, or where a quick recovery is required. Right? Humerus, as I said, priority is to conservative treatment. Osteosynthesis only ten percent of the time. external fixation rarely most of the times it's conservative treatment and healing is never an issue okay elastic nails can be used in the divergent fashion in upper third or with the spindle in the diaphyseal region you don't need to put multiple pins like this you can use the posterior and the posterior line have a stable fixation if it is a lower third fracture if it is a lower third fracture and anti grade entry point as shown here from the deltoid insertion which goes into the pillars supracondylar pillars i had showed you one case earlier can be used and this is extremely stable and you don't need to use any kind of immobilization so potential operative indications are open fractures multiple trauma bilateral injuries compartment syndrome bone cyst with a pathological fracture uh, sometimes with significant nerve injury or if your parents or you are not happy with inadequate close reduction right so elastic nail is an option now special situation now this is a 14 year old spastic child with seizure disorder okay so it's very difficult to control these children with arm to chest strapping or any kind of humorous cast because they don't tolerate cast well in these situations an elastic nailing may be considered where the child has a neurological problem and holding the child with a cast may be very very difficult now this is a child who came to me again a 9 year old child who came with a 30 degree angulation was being treated conservatively and there was a unacceptable bump which could have remodeled but at diaphyseal region the parents were extremely concerned so what we decided was a small procedure we bent the nail a thick 3 mm nail in the opposite direction and with that curve we could correct the deformity because of the elastic property like i told you you can tweak the principles of elastic nailing and that is how we got the correction and comminuted fracture another example where you had a comminution and uh, to prevent shortening what we did was we used an elastic nail and you can see how nicely it incorporates and again you can see in this i have again tweaked the principle i have used different diameter nails so uh, to prevent or to counter the effect of comminuted which may cause a valgus i contoured the thicker nail and turned it around into an s fashion so one c nail which was thinner and an s nail which was thicker to counter the valgus and using these principles we could stabilize the fracture you can see this uh, spindle here and you can see the thicker nail on the outer side and that is how it healed with excellent incorporation and remodeling over a period of time look at this another interesting now this was a segmental with comminution again very difficult to hold and control in a hanging arm cast where it was unstable so a simple single nail which was over contoured into valgus was used for in years insertion followed by a cast and you can see over a period of time how nicely it incorporated and how nicely it remodeled so you can use the elastic nail very smartly using the contouring and tensile properties to give the patient one good pain relief because of stability and second a good alignment so that there is no deformity you are basically reducing the load on biology now this is a 14 year old girl this was a judoka she was you can see the physis is essentially closed she was a national judo player and he came with kind of a comminuted fracture three part fracture comminuted and they were advised open reduction and plating and they didn't want open surgery and scars 
and conservative treatment was leaving them with a deformity and pain so again what we did was couple of nails pre bent in excessive valgus to counter the forces of varus and a small hanging arm cast small percutaneous incision that is how she healed in about 3 months time and that is her result and she is back in action in about 12 weeks with a full function of her elbow and shoulder and she is back to her judo so you can use these in adolescent age group the elastic nails so let me just summarize so in humerus diaphyseal fractures infant and young child just immobilize in a sling and a swath what i prefer is very small neonates up to about 4 5 years i will just do arm to chest strapping with micropore most of you i think will use a u slap but it's very difficult to control a u slap and hold on to it because it keeps on slipping off from the shoulder and if you realize all your plaster techniques essentially the distal fragment tends to go into a varus position okay because you don't have control on the distal fragment and you may have to change the cast whereas when you do arm to chest strapping your strap should be at the apex of the fracture and that should push the angulation to the chest wall so just put a small cotton pad and put a across the fracture strap which will make the arm straight and put the arm forearm next to it and then put arm to chest strapping so small kids my easiest way is in opd i just put some gauze pieces in the axilla cotton padding over the nipple and i do a micro pore arm to chest strapping i change it after 10 days and in 3 to 4 weeks it heals up adolescent and older children open fractures may require debridement and fixator or grade 1 grade 2 compound you can do close reduction with elastic nailing the closed fractures still the primary treatment is closed reduction if the mid shaft angulation exceeds 20 degrees you can do elastic nail if it is less than 20 it remodels well you can just immobilize with arm to chest or a slab or a desalt kind of a arm to sling chest nail so this is a good algorithm to follow in most of the times in humerus fractures so we can't can't hear you so we can't hear you just just a minute i think there was a phone call so i got disconnected okay can you hear me now yes yes hello are you able to hear me yes sir we can hear you yeah okay so i was just saying before we move to tibia do you have any questions about humerus fractures uh, sir i am dr gopendra may i ask a question yeah sure hello uh, sir yes yes go ahead sir in neonates you strap it i also strap it but the uh, fracture unites in internal rotation so how you see the shoulder yep. has got a lot of rotational capacity of remodeling and compensation right so it really doesn't cause any long term problems 
okay the natural whenever you are putting your distal fragment even in a sling or a hanging arm cast how do you put it Uh, the distal fragment is the internal load. Nobody puts the plaster in this position. Do you put your plaster like this? I strip a forearm Go, also. Gopen, Gopendra, are you putting your plasters in external rotation like this? No, sir. Actually, it's not so visible. So every no. patient, whether you do strapping, whether you do desalt bandage. everything puts the hand into internal rotation okay so don't okay. worry about that because there is lot of compensation as well as there is excellent remodeling as neonates so there is no problem at all in older children i may consider but again it is impossible to put it like this yeah thank you sir please okay i think if there are no other questions i will just go to the next uh, topic of the day that is the tibia fracture again uh, tibia fracture is a very interesting thing and why we uh, don't don't talk about these two fractures so much is because essentially treatment is conservative okay this is an 11 year old boy road traffic accident closed fracture choice of treatment is closed reduction cast elastic nail plating or interlock what does what 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 do everybody feel how does the house want to treat it b tens nail tens nail cr and cast tens nail ajo kite b okay tens nail a lot of people want to do elastic nailing yeah i won't say it's wrong it is an option but again let's go conservative treatment of a tibia fracture essentially is conservative okay whether it is 16 month old or 9 and a half year old a plaster a well molded plaster will make your tibia heal Nine out of ten times. Okay, so these two diaphyseal bones, humerus and tibia, most of us will treat it conservatively. Okay, it is not wrong to do elastic nail. The problem with elastic nail is the the canal of the tibia is not in the center of the bone. The medial shin is a subcutaneous, and the canal is actually posterior or more posterior than you think. right and when you enter the nails they don't offer the same kind of spindling and elastic stability that a femur that you get in a femur so the femur and the forearm are more important choices for elastic nailing the tibia and the humerus are secondary choices because most of the times conservative treatment works equally well irrespective of age just remember that indication of surgical management though conservative treatment is favored is increasing if you look at literature it was only 5% surgery between 1995 to 2000 and between 2010 to 2015 it has risen to 26% two things one is we have better training and better usage of elastic nails as everybody just said that we will do elastic nailing the ease and comfort of the patient is much better with immediate stability and more and more patients are unwilling to accept minor malunions which may remodel over time and they want a perfect alignment to begin with nobody is willing to wait for the remodeling so weight bearing bone yeah you may be justified in doing elastic nailing though don't forget and don't throw away the cast it is important to understand that conservative treatment works close reduction and cast what should be the acceptability criteria under 8 years coronal alignment 10 degrees sagittal alignment 15 degrees 50% displacement and 1 cm shortening is acceptable in adults this is less than 5 in the coronal plane less than 10 in sagittal plane 
and less than 15 millimeter shortening is acceptable and in adolescent 8 to 16 it is the same as adults so your tolerance for malalignment reduces after 8 years so you might be justified in treating above 8 surgically because the limits of tolerance are as good as adults the aim of close reduction and cast is to achieve an acceptable alignment second to maintain that acceptable alignment and avoid complications what is the cast technique you must pad the pony prominences especially bimalleolar heel region and in the popliteal area the knee should be flexed by 20 to 40 degrees why is that one you need ground clearance for the child to walk on a walker so a flex knee will help second if you keep the knee extended all the hip motion will get transmitted directly to the fracture and that will cause one pain even on hip motion and second may cause malalignment third the knee always is better nourished the cartilage of the knee is better nourished in flexion than forcing it in extension and fourth when you are in flexion the hamstrings are relaxed the posterior capsule is relaxed and that is why the patient is much more pain free and comfortable so these are the four reasons that you need to give the knee in about 20 to 30 degree flexion when you do are when you are doing a uh, casting for the tibia all right ground clearance avoid locking of the knee and transmission to the fracture site better better nourishment of cartilage and relaxation of hamstrings when you are doing a plaster for lower third tibia never try to bring the ankle to neutral or dorsiflexion because you will end up creating recurvatum equinus position is preferred and don't worry about stiffness the ta will come back casting it in equinus for 8 weeks does not cause a contracture okay wherever you feel there is excessive edema or impending compartment a prophylacting bivalving or univalving is preferable if it is a fiberglass always bivalve so that there is some expansion if you are using a lightweight plaster which is expandable like delta light which is expandable then it is a different issue but otherwise try to use a bivalved cast if the swelling is excessive and always take a second look at the cast at the end of 8 to 10 days common malalignments if you have a fractured tibia with an intact fibula it tends to drift into varus okay it encroaches onto the interosseous membrane fibular fracture at the same level it tends to drift into valgus with shortening and it's important to understand how to do cast wedging so as you can see conservative treatment even though it works is labor intensive for the surgeon as well as patient so you can always offer a conservative treatment to your patients because most parents don't want an operation but you must pay good attention to the alignment and you must be attentive to cast wedging techniques so like in this particular case you can see there is recurvatum at the fracture site so at less than two weeks old you can make a cut in the cast and then open the wedge and then get the alignment corrected and continue with your plaster right use a small wooden stick to put into that opened wedge and you can correct the malalignment but always when you are doing this technique observe for skin pinching when you are opening you might get a pressure sore or a skin pinching sore in the calf region posteriorly so be very very careful or then you may just need to recast it with better alignment so this is again tibia fibula same level like i said it tends to go into valgus and you can do what is called as a castotomy or cast wedging cut the cast 
mold it into virus and recast it. Overlap of about a centimeter doesn't matter as long as coronal and sagittal alignment is good. And this is how it remodels very nicely without any long term consequences. Okay. Close reduction needs a good follow up. Normally, we will give cast for four weeks above knee, and then we will do four weeks below knee for mobilization of the knee and comfort to the patient after callus is formed. And at least eight to 12 weeks of plaster till you remove it in TBL. That is a good time to remove the plaster. You can also consider sarmiento cast bracing like a patella tendon bearing cast in three, four weeks after uh, the surgery. Oh, sorry, after the letter. Give me a moment, please. Yeah, sorry for that. <clears throat> okay. So, cast, uh, Sarmiento cast bracing. You know, Dr. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So, Sarmiento passed away last week. You must have read in the papers. It was there on the WhatsApp also. He was a brilliant man who talked about the hydrostatic pressure in compartments and utilization of that with functional cast braces and had a wonderful textbook on conservative treatment of all fractures, including in adults. So you can do Sarmiento cast bracing a lot of times and it works just brilliantly. So in children, it's very easy and good to do this kind of <coughs> weight bearing cast bracing, especially where you don't have the facilities for surgical interventions. This is very good. And this is a skill which is probably lost nowadays. Nobody does Sarmiento cast bracing. Okay. Disadvantage of plaster technique, cast immobilization, stiffness, and delayed resumption of activity. Surgical management, indications, open fractures, something like this. A compound fracture, obviously, you will need to debride and stabilize. Compartment syndrome, where you need to do a fasciotomy, it's better to stabilize internally. Failure to achieve or maintain reduction. Obese adolescent children, again, as I said, eight and above, maybe like an adult, heavy child, treat like an adult. Transverse mid shaft fractures sometimes may require elastic nailing, okay, to stabilize them. You can use this and couple that with a slab or a cast. Unstable fractures, which need to be stabilized in older children. Okay. Isolated fracture, which is drifting into varus, which is not correctable because you have no control. When there is an intact fibula, sometimes because of the muscle activity, which is all anterolateral, there is a drift of the fracture and you may end up with an unacceptable varus deformity. So in these situations, you may consider elastic nailing. Or a fracture which is not reducible. You are not able to get a reduction at all. You may consider nailing. Comminuted fractures which are unstable. You may consider using the nail in older children for pain management and better alignment. So as I said, more and more utilization of minimally invasive technique is happening. The percentage of elastic nailing usage has gone up to 25% over many years. Ipsilateral polytrauma, a femur with tibia. So, adolescent femur and tibia. So, elastic nailing for the tibia and a interlocking nail done by my adult colleagues for the femur. That is how we did this. That is how it healed. Plating. Plating is essentially for juxta articular fractures, either too proximal or too distal near the epiphyseal plate. Or length unstable fractures. Again, length unstable is one of the indications where a plate may be used. Interlock nailing of the conventional type is preferred only when the apophysis and epiphysis is closed. Even if the apophysis is open and you put a nail, you may damage the apophysis and cause weaker vitam. And it may cause limb length discrepancy. So tibial tuberosity is very sensitive. Preferably, don't violate it using adult conventional interlocking nails unless 
unless it is a closed apophysis okay skeletally mature let's talk about some specific fractures in tibia toddler injury common as child slips and falls from a little wet floor or some water spilled on the floor and is not walking or starts limping okay this is typically seen in very young kids 2 3 year old and they will limp or not walk correctly and x ray may be normal typically a toddler fracture x ray will show callus after 3 weeks okay so you should be aware of toddler fracture proximal tibia metaphyseal fracture is a special fracture an isolated fibula tibia fibula open tibia distal and floating knee this is an example where you have a very thin spiral fracture it's a stable fracture normally i don't even cast it the child is comfortable except for a little limp it doesn't displace and it heals in 2 3 weeks okay if the child is very cranky or unable to load it you can cast but sometimes in that age group the child is walking around if the child is walking and not crying i will leave it alone explain to the parents that this will heal and the child's limp will go away after some time otherwise you need to cast with 10 degree flexion for about 3 weeks now this proximal tibial metaphyseal fracture is something everybody should know this is something that is called cosens fracture now any fracture in the upper third of the tibia for some vague reason there are lot of theories to it even if, if you do a good close reduction because of overgrowth tends to drift into valgus there is a potential for valgus overgrowth usually between 3 and 6 years when there is natural physiological valgus so in that growth spurt it tends to grow more into valgus some people have advocated casting in a bit varus to prevent or counter this some people believe incomplete fracture should be completed usually the valgus which happens remodels in 2 to 3 years so you should wait till that time if it doesn't then the cosens fracture may require growth modulation or corrective surgery so this is an example you can see that asymmetric growth and a valgus deformity after a proximal tibial fracture in the growing child and that may sometimes need growth modulation or an osteotomy but it is less than 10% of the time isolated tibia with intact fibula often middle third as i said muscle forces will result a drift into varus okay so mold it in valgus in your first cast itself wedging can be done but it is very difficult because of the intact fibula and you might be forced to use elastic nails to maintain alignment the distal metaphyseal tibia fracture is also called as gillespie fracture where the apex is posterior and it may cause recurvatum if you try to dorsiflex the ankle to neutral so it's important to let it hang in gravity equinus and maintain the correct sagittal plane alignment when you cast it so it's all about good casting in these kids so this is an example of a gillespie fracture a lower third tibia fibula typically you can see if you dorsiflex the ankle you will end up with a posterior angulation and that is very difficult to uh, remodel and the child's parents will always complain they have uh, hyperdorsiflexion and a bad looking deformity okay so cast in gravity equinus let it hang and then do your cast in equinus so that you don't end up with a problem if it is unacceptable you can see this lateral x ray unacceptable this will going to cause problem you can wedge it you can see an anterior wedging here and correction of that into correct position distal third tibia fibula like the distal radius ulna childhood fracture close reduction usually works but you must exaggerate the deformity and you may use percutaneous k wires so this is a case which i got two days ago so this is just to highlight to you the reduction maneuver now this was a 7 or 8 year old child who had a completely displaced tibia fibula fracture the medial side you can see was indenting the skin yeah you can see that there was a blackish blue discoloration and inside out near compound fracture so what we did was 
exaggerate the deformity as i said hold the heel and distal fragment and i exaggerated the deformity and then i gently milked both the fragments down and then i pushed it into varus and then we did a siam shoot and you can see this you can see this and then i am doing a k wire stabilization a percutaneous k wire cross k wires just to hold the pieces together and uh, this is to show you how the reduction was achieved and the k wires being passed just to hold the pieces together one wire from proximal to distal and the second one from distal to proximal check in both views just to hold the reduction so that it doesn't slip and then a cast was given so a very small percutaneous technique to hold a fracture and that is how you can achieve reduction and in couple of months you can remove the wires once callus is seen in about 3 4 weeks carry on with the cast and it does very well so pinning again is a good technique for the distal metaphyseal fracture and they do pretty well so to summarize tibia essentially the treatment is conservative there are few indications for surgery you must master the cast technique and wedging and you should know about these special fractures the gillespy fracture the distal fourth tibia fibula fracture the cousins fracture and the toddler fracture and elastic nails in a few indications in adolescent pre adolescent age group where heavy child polytrauma multiple fractures can be used especially if it is drifting into varus so with that i'll stop this talk and before we go to the last talk on ankle fractures if there are any questions i will answer so anybody has any questions sir, for me yes sir sir uh, you have showed one polytrauma sir ipsilateral femur and tibia yeah and that the uh, femur nail is put from uh, piriformis sir i know i was waiting for some smart person to tell me that why sir But i didn't do it i did not do it i told you my adult colleagues did it and called me for the tibia fracture okay sir sir for, for our tibia, adult trauma surgeons did the nailing and they i told them that don't do it but they put that nail through the piriform fossa i wouldn't have done that i won't recommend it i like i said avian whatever has been reported is because of piriform entry is physis had close so not much of a problem happened but uh, to be technically correct why do it no? yes sir for for tibia and fibula you have uh, done posterior approach and posterior plating sir no 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 that was from a textbook in a length unstable fracture my choice is to use elastic nail and a mini fixator you know that i have already told you length unstable i would prefer to use see if i can keep the whole fracture segment closed why would i open it i am not a very big fan of plating because i believe that you can bring out the length by a fixator till callus 3 4 weeks of fixator doesn't cause problem and internal stability by elastic nails but to complete everything people have done plating depending on the fracture combination and the site of fracture mm. first you do external fixation then you pass the tens no 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 first you give traction pass your nails the nails are not stable because there is segmental combination or combination which will allow it to collapse right okay. then you can pass one pin above and one pin below and with traction bring it out to length and tighten your clamps get some alignment by passing one or two nail, one nail or maybe both the nails also you can always pull it out to length okay sir sir all right to what hello yes yes sir up to what age uh, remodeling occurs in uh, for the tbf fractures if you want to conserve so remodeling as i said you should know what are the criteria of acceptability right in between 8 and 12 no it is like adult in the coronal and sagittal plane not more than 5 to 10 degrees is acceptable because okay. then remodeling is not that good especially in the distal third 
okay sir so if you want to conserve a younger kid less than 8 you can accept up to 15 degrees to 20 degrees right sir yes and thank you sir. like i said remember the cosens phenomenon there even if your reduction is good it still goes into valgus okay thank you sir sir uh, what about uh, rotational malalignment sir in tibia how to how to uh, assess while uh, doing close reduction <coughs> the rotational alignment how to assess yeah so uh, rohit whenever i do my close reduction on the tibia i put the leg by the side of the table okay i put a small bolster under the knee so that the knee is flexed all right so bring the patient down get his leg off the table and let it hang in that hanging position gravity will align your leg look at the tibial tuberosity and look at the center of the first uh, second web that is metatarsal 2 they should be aligned in the correct plane and the gravity equinus will prevent you from going into recurvatum and then you mold your cast with your hands by the side okay so what i will do is start at the tibial tuberosity and come supra malleolus and then i will side to side compression and allow the ankle to hang don't see as orthopedic adult orthopedic surgeon you have this tendency and in residency you have been taught that ankle neutral la paije so you tend to push that ankle up and in tibia especially middle distal it will go into recurve and that's a horrible deformity and it doesn't remodel very well okay so let it hang in gravity equinus and do side to side compression the second plaster will be going from the toes to again the tuberosity with slight equinus and the third plaster bring the child up and do in 20 degree flexion in the knee making sure asis and patel are in one way so th- those are my three plasters that i do okay some people have all another technique they you they use what is known as a sugar tong or a u slab so you make a long slab and you go from laterally fibula neck of fibula down around the calcaneum and come medially to the medial uh, collateral ligament so a long u slab and they use it like a clamp Okay. and then they'll use a plaster bandage instead of a uh, cotton bandage and convert that slab into a cast okay. and then mold it okay so there are various techniques you have to develop your own way what you need to look at is that not more than 10 degrees of malalignment in any plane and by malalignment i said translation is okay 50% but malalignment means angular okay. or torsional so that you can make out right so casting is a lost art more people will say ye sab karne se acha hai baad mein wedging karna hai nail dal dete hain so the minute you get a child who is heavy slightly plump more than 8 9 10 years the 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 threshold of nailing is pretty low nowadays and i am uh, not against it because it is a big bother to a bad cast can give you a bad name as long mm-hmm. as you have good sterile techniques and you follow the principles elastic nailing is a good idea only thing is when you make your entry you have two ways of doing it again on either side of the tuberosity make sure you don't violate the tibial tuberosity and the canal is not in center so in your lateral the same thing happens if the nails are not turned around you will get recurvatum so you must make sure in the lateral profile when the elastic nail is put you turn it so that the hook faces posteriorly and you don't end up with recurvatum deformity okay because the canal is not centric it is eccentric and the muscle forces are not centric they are all anterolateral okay medial shin there is no balance force around the tibia all the muscles come from the interosseous membrane and towards the fibular side medial side there are hardly any muscles hmm. right so let's go with the last talk on ankle fractures which again is very interesting and this is important is yeah so uh, in cosen fracture what do you prefer uh, complete the fracture or uh, no no i i i cast it in slight varus i don't complete the fracture 
but i will counsel the parents that this fracture is such that you are going to drift into valgus and you have to be patient for 2 3 years after that a small percentage may need correction most of them will remodel but you tell telling them pre pre op uh, is important if you don't know that this phenomenon exists they will blame it on bad reduction you have to tell them whatever you do it will drift into valgus okay can you see the slide no sir ha huh? no sir No, yes or no no sir no sir okay just a minute share screen okay now yes sir yes sir okay okay so ankle fractures again a case based discussion on ankle fractures for you now this is a 10 year old boy all right and again i will ask you a question how will you treat this is a screw close reduction and cast close reduction kvr close reduction cannulated screw open reduction tbw close reduction what would you prefer close reduction cannulated screw sir okay good so this is what was done is it okay yes sir no sir okay somebody said yes okay so what's wrong with this one if you see the joint line articular alignment is not restored okay number one there is no reduction second the kvr which was kept was left in for 6 months and this is what happened okay yes sir so what you must realize is that this is an adduction injury you can see fibula is salter 1 and this is a push off fracture the talus hits the medial malleolus from the inside and it's a vertical shear and this is the worst fracture you can get because it violates articular cartilage and growth plate and crushes metaphysis so there's always comminution here right which is why growth arrest is very high with this if you do not get accurate reduction okay salta harris for needs accurate reduction additional imaging you can see here on the ct scan it demonstrates the amount of comminution and crushing of bone especially in the growing end so you must counsel the family again additional imaging as required and a transverse screw is what is recommended now this was a triplane so there is a metaphyseal ap screw also but this is a closed procedure you can see the arthrogram you can see the talus you can see the articular alignment and the transverse intra epiphyseal screw to hold the reduction and that is how it heals and that is what should be done okay so let's go back to that what is this type let me highlight for you again salter 1 on the lateral malleolus and salter 4 on the medial malleolus okay the classification you should know you should know how to describe the pattern of injury how to treat it and tell about complications with prognosis okay so there are various fractures which may be seen this is salter 2 okay if you see the salter harris classification all of them are salter 2 this is a salter 2 with a metaphyseal fragment this is a salter 2 this is a salter 2 but here it is anterior here this is posterior here this is lateral so salter harris 2 does not describe the mechanism of injury okay so for the ankle fractures it is not enough to know the salter harris classification the salter harris is always an adjunct but what you need to know it does doesn't tell you how it needs to be realigned or treated you must use the pediatric counterpart of the log hansen okay that depends on what is the position of the foot and what is the direction of the force is the foot supinated or is it pronated and is the force adduction abduction or external rotation okay so this is tajian's modification of log hansen classification in addition to the salter harris which you should obviously know 
so let me describe the patterns of injury in pediatric ankle fractures for all of you the first one is called si injury that is supination inversion commonest injury i told you i showed you two cases already earlier supination inversion injury is in two stages okay the first stage of a supination inversion is either a salter harris type 1 injury of the distal fibula physis or if this is very strong and the child is adolescent a avulsion of the atfl okay an ankle sprain as it is known and the stage 2 if this opens up and the force continues is the talus pushing the medial malleolus off so this is salter 4 intra articular intra epiphyseal and going across to metaphysis right so this is what happens but you can make this out clinically simply by looking at the position of the foot and ankle obviously the overall deformity is varus if it is varus treatment is make the entire force reverse by doing valgus so first thing is obtain a satisfactory reduction by closed methods if you don't get it you may consider open but you will get it most of the times now does the treatment end here okay even if you get a close reduction the medial is a shear injury and is never stable if this is treated just with a plaster this is what happens this again drifted and you can see the articular mal alignment and a facial arrest and that caused a problem to this child so never treat it only with a cast this is what may happen articular mal alignment and a growth arrest so once you get a close reduction can somebody mute their themselves i can see a lot of background noise mr mr mukesh his mic is on i think yeah so this is after reduction what you should do is an one this you should see that the width is equal and there are vertical shear forces so you need to reduce those by a transverse pin and that pin instead of a k wire needs to be a cannulated cancel screw for compression okay so a cannulated screw which is intra epiphyseal percutaneous again this does not finish the treatment you need to do an arthrogram so you do an arthrogram put a little dye and look at the quality of reduction and then you do a little stress examination after the medial screw do a varus force if the fibular fracture opens up then you may put a k wire here for temporary stabilization if it doesn't you may just cast it okay and finally you follow till facial injury hello can you mute yourself Mukesh Dharma, can you please mute yourself? Hello, Mukesh. Can you just mute? Hello. Host can do that. Ashok. or uh, whoever is from ortho tv can you just please mute mukesh dharma oh okay hello yes yeah, sir now you can start yeah sir. so the last thing that you need to do is make sure that you are looking at the park and harris growth arrest lines after any injury you will always see a temporary cessation of growth when they come for follow up just look at whether the line of density which is the growth arrest line with growth if it remains parallel to the facial plate it tells you that you will not end up with a focal facial bar or a growth arrest and there will be no deformation 
okay an mri will confirm it but you should look for the facial growth arrest line whether it is parallel to the physis and the joint as long as that happens you need not worry so this is what should be done i spoke about the fibula what do you do to the fibula do you really think it needs fixation after your screw fixation you stress it if it is stable you need not fix it just cast it if it is unstable and opening up you may put a small k wire so let me show you an example of the technique again i showed you the pre op x ray displaced pull off fracture of the lateral salter 1 and push off fracture of the salter 4 on the medial side i aspirated the hematoma i put in some dye you can see how the dye is all irregular here this is pre reduction this is how the needle was put and then this is post reduction post reduction you can see the even distribution then with your reduction being held i pass a small guide pin intra epiphyseal not crossing the facial plate and a small cannulated screw a compression with a washer may or may not be needed you may do away with it try to use a longer thread because removal of the screw becomes extremely difficult if you use a very short thread so at least 32 mm thread to get compression across the fracture so this is all that you need a small percutaneous 11 number incision for that screw fixation and you should be all right so let's move from this si injury to something that is called as peer pronation eversion external rotation this is pattern 2 in the ankle injuries now you can look at this x ray and tell me the fibular fracture is always metaphyseal it is not epiphyseal and the tibial fracture is always salter 2 okay and the foot alignment is always valgus okay so just by looking at the position of the foot you can tell what injury this is si injury is in varus per injury is external rotation and valgus and since it is external rotation there will be spiral fracture so the tibia injury as you can see here is a salter 2 fracture pattern there will be a metaphyseal spike sometimes it may be only salter 1 soft tissue injury the periosteum from here is avulsed large flap is usually there and the fibular fracture is a spiral fracture and it is metadiaphyseal it is extra facial okay and the overall deformity here is valgus angulation this is typical of a pronation eversion external rotation injury again like i said what is the mechanism and how do you undo it so you will do internal rotation and varus the problem that you can anticipate is one sometimes the periosteal flap may get incarcerated or on the medial side there are two structures which we will come to so close reduction and after it is reduced if it is unstable metaphyseal screw fixation if the thurston holland fragment are big enough you can see the medial gap sometimes you may get incarceration of the periosteal flap okay so that may require attention sometimes you may not get the reduction so what you do is a smooth pin if you need to pass you always aim for center center of the epiphysis so that you don't cause an angular deviation and remove it in the shortest period of time the fibular fracture again as i said is metaphyseal or diaphyseal and need not be treated just a cast is enough okay this is how you treat it couple of pins going through the center okay what are the common complications interposition like i said an incarcerated periosteal flap may block reduction or may cause growth related issues so you may have to do a small incision and pull that flap out the other tissues which may get entrapped is tibialis posterior tendon rarely and neurovascular bundle rarely so always when you are reducing if you feel there is inadequate reduction or a big gap seen something is trapped okay and you may need to open reduce it in that situation 
so here you can see a very big periosteal flap was incarcerated and that had to be removed and you can just suture it back after it is removed and pass some smooth pins okay periosteum can be removed from that medial side so this is an example where we have put a cancellous screw in the metaphyseal fragment and smooth pins across the physis for temporary stability this is an example of a peer injury and you can see after excision of that periosteal flap smooth pin across and a cancellous screw in the metaphysis and then a cast and early removal of pins the screw can be removed later and that should restore the function the fibula will heal always uneventfully moving on from this pattern let's go to the next pattern now this is something called as external rotation injury so this is a supination external rotation fracture where if you see very closely the distal tibia shows a very thin spiral fracture okay this is a supination external rotation injury and you will see a spiral fracture here and the fun part of is that in the stage 1 the tibia fails before the fibula normally the fibular fracture happens earlier in the other patterns in the supination external rotation the tibial fracture is a spiral fracture or a salter one injury here and this is how it goes salter one or a distal spiral fracture and after that if the forces continue then the fibula fails okay so stage 1 is tibia stage 2 is fibula not like the other two and this is again a spiral fracture it's important to look at the lateral x ray always because the salter one tibia fracture may be missed why am i saying this sometimes you get a child with an isolated fibular spiral fracture and you may think that like an adult this is simple spiral fracture of fibula and you may miss the type one distal tibial fascial injury because in a adolescent or a child it's always the tibia failing first and then the fibula so you don't get isolated fibular spiral fractures in children okay so you should note that fibula fails after the tibial fracture if you don't see the spiral tibia you will have a salter one tibia distally only after that the fibula fails okay so the overall deformity will be external rotation so as i said beware of the isolated fibular metaphyseal spiral fracture you will always on lateral see a widening here and that's a salter one tibia okay <clears throat> and it may be important to reduce it accurately so fibula fracture is obvious but the tibial fracture may be missed and clinically when you see the leg is lying in external rotation okay because it goes in external rotation and supination tibia has to fail first if you don't see tibial fracture it's a salter one tibia and then fibula so look at the clinical picture and undo it so the external rotation has to be undone brought back to neutral and then you may consider stabilization so beware of the isolated fibular metaphyseal fractures and here what rohit kade was asking the rotation is important don't miss the mal rotation and these fractures if you have a large fibular uh, <coughs> sorry tibial spiral after you re reverse the mechanism it will close and then you may use metaphyseal screws make sure on the lateral the salter one translation is also corrected you may need to pull it forward and close it nicely in dorsiflexion and then if it is highly swollen or unstable you can use metaphyseal screws finally the last pattern in a child is plantar flexion injury so in this you will get an obvious salter two injury but the long posterior fragment forces the distal talus and ankle to move behind so this is supination with plantar flexion injury and its components are again a metaphyseal fracture a salter two fracture of the distal tibia and a fibular fracture which is usually metaphyseal and there is posterior displacement 
okay you will always see this coming out anteriorly and there is gross plantar flexion with posterior translation okay so this you must again reverse <coughs> the forces with a close reduction you must exaggerate the deformity milk it down and with your hand push the distal tibia behind <coughs> and correct the translocation once you correct the translocation with your knee flex bring the heel forward and push the distal tibia back you will get your reduction if it is swollen or unstable a couple of metaphyseal screws and cast okay so these are the four common fracture patterns seen in children now there are two special intra articular fracture patterns in adolescents now this particular fracture is commonly missed look at this x ray carefully you might think this is normal because a mortise view has not been taken this can be easily missed and what you see here is a telox fracture now this is a distal tibio fibular ligamentous avulsion fracture this is an intra articular fracture and unless you take a mortise view you will miss it and this is always on the fibular side because the medial tibial epiphysis always fuses earlier than the lateral tibial distal epiphysis so this is fused this is unfused and from here the ligament with your torsional injury will avulse the fragment from the intra articular part okay so this is a distal tibio fibular ligamentous avulsion fracture which is caused by a torsional injury and it is intra articular beware because it needs fixation and don't miss it this have to be managed by a percutaneous or an open reduction and a cancellous screw fixation okay it's an oblique screw going from anterolateral to posterior medial and the distal tibial physis will close after it is done okay a ct scan is usually advisable in juvenile and adolescent fractures around the ankle for de better definition and delineation of these fragments so that you don't miss these injuries and this is how you treat it now the second component of a telo fracture now this is what you saw on the ap view sometimes when you see an ap like this you will see the lateral x ray shows a salter 2 injury with an anterior opening okay but this is not a true plantar flexion injury you already have on ap something like a telo fragment on the lateral you have a salter 2 injury so what is this fracture pattern okay now this is called a triplane fracture this is the second special fracture that happens in a child what are the three planes in the triplane the same injury in the coronal plane goes intra articular then it goes horizontal and then it goes vertical so the distal fragment is a big piece like this which is shearing across the growth plate and after that the fibula fails okay so the vertical injury or the sagittal plane injury is through the epiphysis the second plane injury the horizontal is through the physis and third the coronal is through the metaphysis so these are the three planes always identify this with a ct scan the treatment can be done closed rarely you need to open how do you confirm alignment and what are the fixation methods so just understand the fracture the first thing when you see this fracture look at this a telo fracture is usually more lateral you are seeing on an ap an intra epiphyseal intra articular fracture which is right in the center what are you seeing on lateral okay you see that this is one plane the second is going to go across horizontally and the third in the lateral will be vertical okay so these are the three planes of the triplane fracture and you will know the directional displacement on a ct scan okay so you take a lateral but always get a ct scan okay ct will show when you take a cut of the ct through the epiphysis what do you see this is what you see a sagittal fracture okay these are the two fragments the same fracture when you take a cut from the metaphysis 
Okay, what do you see? So this is in the sagittal plane. Okay, that is the epiphyseal fracture. If you take a cut from the metaphysis on a CT, what do you see? The plane has changed. This is now in the coronal plane. Okay, so this is how it is displaced. It's the same fracture, just going upwards. The plane here is in the coronal plane. So how do you reduce this when the two fractures, though continuous, are in different planes? So you can joystick them. What you do is you put two K wires into the epiphyseal fragment. Don't touch the metaphysis. Okay, put a K wire into the epiphysis, into the epiphysis, and close the book. Pull them towards each other. When you close them, they will close this sagittal plane. and then you push the pins across so that they stabilize you do nothing in the metaphysis but the same maneuver will reduce this automatically the pins are in the epiphysis but the metaphyseal fracture also will close okay and when you close this you put an antero posterior screw for a lag effect so this is how you fix it your two screws the metaphyseal screw is always antero posterior and your epiphyseal screw is always medial lateral okay but the maneuvering happens in the epiphysis you close the fragments and then you put your screws you may need to do a little maneuvering there and finally like in all fractures if you are doing a close technique arthrogram find out that the joint line is good so ap screws for the coronal metaphyseal fragment and lateral screw for the epiphyseal fragment that's the telo fragment okay and arthrogram and then a cast for some time so this is the peculiarity of a triplane an example 13 year old boy you can see a large lateral on the lateral view a large salter 2 on an ap and intraarticular fracture always get a ct you will see things better you can see the coronal plane in the metaphysis and you can see in the lateral how it is translated and that is how you need to fix it okay transverse screw for the epiphysis and ap screw for the metaphysis so to summarize we have looked at four patterns supination inversion pronation inversion external rotation supination external rotation where tibia first fibula next and a plantar flexion with supination this is called the pediatric part of the log hansen and two special fractures which are intraarticular and need fixation tilo fracture and triplane fracture so let's go back to that earlier adult treatment for a medial malleolus so this needed now this has a growth arrest so what i did here was we got a mri this was quite a large growth arrest here and it was quite diffuse so what we did was he he was about 9 or 10 years old he had five more years of growth fibula was overgrowing so what we did was we did a intra epiphyseal facial bar excision from the medial side the lateral part of the tibial physis was good so we left it then i opened that area then i did a 1 cm resection of the fibula we shortened the fibula i used this as a graft here and in the area where there was a scar i put a fat graft so that to prevent reformation so we used a burr and took out the focal epiphyseal bar on the metaphyseal side i put that fibular strut and i put a k wire to fix it and i shortened the fibula and to prevent the fibula from overgrowing we drilled this and put screws across and that was the picture and that is after 1 year and 14 months that is after 12 months this is after 14 months you can see because of the fat graft this has not reformed this bridge has healed up this epiphysis has closed down and we had a very good correction with a normal function that is at maturity okay so with that i will stop the ankle fracture session and we'll take any questions if anybody has thank you Uh, sir for last case why fat graft sir i didn't understand when you have a trans epiphyseal facial bar no whenever you remove or resect the bar the bleeding 
can re-establish new bone formation. Whenever you put fat as an interposition material, it will prevent reformation of the bar. That is why whenever you resect a facial bar, I will see we have one more session left on facial injuries. In that, I will explain fat grafting. So when you excise a fat a facial bar, you put fat or an inert material which will prevent reformation of the facial bar. Bone wax. Fat resorption doesn't happen, Nitin sir. It always remains like a cavity there. Yeah. Somehow fat has a property. If you see all pseudarthrosis, CPT, synovial pseudarthrosis, non-union, you'll always see synovial tissue and fat. Somehow the fat has a property of inhibiting bone formation. Yeah, can you mute? Somebody is again put the speaker on. Uh, sir, for cast wedging, like you yeah. circumferentially remove the uh, cast, sir, like uh, yes. one centimeter or two cent, like how much you remove, sir? It depends on how much correction you want. It may be more than one centimeter. It may be up to two centimeters. So you need wooden wedges, which are cut out. Small wood wedges, or sometimes we use the gypsum or stick rather than a plastic. You can use that, cut it to size and do your correction. When you cut the plaster and you open a wedge and then insert those wedges till your x-ray looks aligned. And then you will cast over that. Okay, sir. Cast over that uh, plastic thing, sir. Plastic. So you have to open the wedge and then recast it. Okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, while doing arthrotomy, what is the direction of the needle and uh, what is the... Arthrogram. Arthro, arthro, arthrogram. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So you have to go intra-articular. You can go anteromedial where there is no important structure. You can feel your way with a small needle, 18 number. Feel the medial malleolar bone and go medial to it on CM control and it will find a soft spot and it will just go in. Okay. Yeah. So it's anteromedial entry point. All right. So I think ankle fractures are not very commonly seen, but when they are seen, they're very interesting. And you should know the patterns that I described. So that whenever you see the next, the commonest, the worst of these lot is the supination inversion. Because on the medial side, it is a sort of four, which is intra-articular and intra -epiphyseal. And for God's sake, don't pass K wires and leave them in or do TBW. You will cause growth arrest, which is what I showed you. The screw must be transverse intra -epiphyseal. The amount of crushing will determine whether there is growth arrest or not. But your surgery should try to avoid that. You can't guarantee it but you shouldn't add to it by doing a TBW and compressing it further. If you are going to use a K wire anywhere across the physis, as I have already said, remove it in less than three weeks. So don't treat a medial malleolus like a medial malleolus in an adult. Use a transverse intra epiphyseal screw and you should be all right. Okay. Okay. So, shall we end today's session here, Nitin sir? Any questions? No, no problem. It was very good, good and elaborating uh, and illustrative lecture today. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, sir. All Thank ideas you, sir. clear. Sir, so there is one yeah. very small question actually. Humorous, Tell me. Uh, humorous, uh, uh, proximal humorous. Uh, how to how to uh, prevent axillary nerve injury, sir. I mean, uh, when passing proximal. Yeah, so that, that's why I was saying ki when you are passing K wires, there's this small risk of one infection, second hitting that axillary nerve there. So your entry point has to be as vertical as possible from the deltoid next to the AC joint. So you are coming from top and going medially the axillary nerve will be somewhere in the mid deltoid region here, not at the insertion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're going from top like this vertical, 
there is no chance of hitting it and the second one go from the insertion from the diaphysis and go medially okay okay so cross kyr i prefer to go one from it's like going nearly intramedullary okay and then you are once you are in the fragment angulate a little and engage the distal one that's a and see conservative is extremely good the kyrs are like internal decoration they don't add to too much stability some amount of alignment for couple of weeks is enough i try to pull them out within two weeks three weeks as early as possible don't leave them for too long and if at all you want if it's a hefty fellow sometimes you get adolescents who are really bulky and they won't tolerate strapping conservative treatment or plaster elastic nails give them excellent stability with divergent fashion and you are totally justified about 12 years to do that though the remod see you are reducing the load on biology by aligning them better and giving pain relief and a more efficient way of holding like i said it's a little difficult to learn initially because the principles are slightly different <coughs> but it's not even that that bad yeah sir okay sir hello yes sir, uh, sir after uh, after fixing the uh, malleolus with the screw parallel screw yeah it uh, told check for the uh, gro growth lines whether they are uniform or not yes yes uh, what can we do if we don't if we uh, if the lines are not parallel sir what can we do correct so if the lines are not parallel and they are converging to one point you are likely to get both growth arrest there so then you will warn the parents that this child is likely to get deviation if you anticipate and counsel them in advance first thing is that before you do the surgery you take consent and you tell them this is a crushing injury where growth may be affected i am trying to restore alignment and growth let's hope for the best 90% will not happen 10% it will happen most of us go on the defensive and the parents feel the surgery created the problem whereas it is a fracture nature and crushing which creates the problem so whenever you take consent and talk to parents always start off saying even in scfe Okay. you should know how to talk so what you have to say is that because of the injury the blood supply to the head has been cut off and the head is displaced i will be doing my best to gently put it back so that blood supply restarts 90% chance it will come back completely 10% it may not if it does not additional surgery may be needed in the future same with growth arrest there has been a crushing injury to the root or the growing end of your ankle bone we will be restoring your alignment accurately in the gentlest possible way without major open surgery so that growth resumes 90% chance that it will resume 10% if it doesn't there will be shortening and deviation for which there is a solution but it will be another surgery at an older age don't start off saying that सर्जरी के बाद अरेस्ट हो सकता है देन दे स्टार्ट फीलिंग सर्जरी के वजह से अरेस्ट हो रहा है बी वेरी केयरफुल व्हेन यू से थिंग्स या जॉइंस जेम्स हैज रेज हिज हैंड आई थिंक विल टेक दैट लास्ट क्वेश्चन यस इज रिमूव द हैंड सो ओके <laughs> okay so let's stop here and good night everybody we'll meet next wednesday again after seeing good the good night sir good night sir, good night, sir. Good night, sir.